Live from Case at 12, the night beat starts right now. It's a boost in getting to herd immunity here at home. Children as young as 12 getting Pfizer's COVID-19 vaccine on the same day a CDC advisory panel gave the green light. We hear from those who received their first dose and their parents coming up. The check may not be in the mail and mailboxes at an apartment complex targeted in San Antonio. The woman police say was behind the massive mail theft coming up. Plus, after a year long pause, the Fiesta spirit coming back to San Antonio. The big reveal for this year's Fiesta poster coming up. But first, freedom from masks and the ability to visit with grandparents. Those were among the list of reasons kids wanted to get the COVID-19 vaccine. Some San Antonio teenagers started lining up shortly after the CDC committee approved the Pfizer vaccine for kids as young as 12. The night team's Patty Santo said Heritage Pediatrics as the first group of kids rolled in for those shots. You were the absolute first one. Excitement in the parking lot of Heritage Pediatrics. It's just exciting to like be a part of the solution to like get back normalcy. The first group of kids 12 to 15 years old got their first Pfizer COVID-19 shot Wednesday. I think it's cool to be like some of the first people to get like COVID vaccinated as a kid. There's no hesitation for these kids and parents. It's a shot at getting back some freedom. She's in high school, she's on the dance team, and she's exposed. They understand the importance of this, and they understand that once uh, we're all vaccinated, we can start flying again and feel safe about it. Dr. John Fitch wants parents to trust the advice from medical experts and to learn from the example of these young kids. All of them are children of physicians in our community. And so we wanted our community to know that we're not just recommending this to other people. We've given it to our own kids today. Including his youngest. You are set. There we go. Okay. Go he says many parents started calling on Monday, anticipating the CDC announcement, wanting to sign up their kids for a shot. Others still have questions. The biggest question we get is why should I give it to my child who really doesn't tend to get so sick from the, the virus? His answer, it prevents rare complications and even death. It also means a kid exposed won't have to quarantine unless they show symptoms. And then the third thing is that it's a, it's a benefit to, to our community. He expects side effects from the shot to be even milder than those seen in adults. These kids aren't worried just glad to do their part. I'm not worried if I get it. I'm worried about passing it on to someone who would be at risk. And of course, just talk to your pediatrician about any specific health concerns you have about your child. But if you're ready to give it to them, you can go to any location where the Pfizer vaccine is being given. Steve Isis. And Patty, mega sites like the Alamo Dome are also offering the Pfizer vaccine. This could also maybe lead to an increase in demand for the y shot. Yeah, and we're talking about kids that are 12 and up at this point. Is Pfizer giving any indication that they can be a benefit to younger children? Right now, they're looking at the age group between 2 and 11 years old, and they hope to have some data by around September. So we'll find out then. Hard to decide who is more excited, the parents or the kids. <laughs> the kids <laughs> Thank, Thank you, Thank you, Patty. So much, Patty. Well, there are several questions parents have been asking about the COVID-19 vaccine. We have a Q&A with pediatrician with a pediatrician from University Health. It's all online right now at ksat.com. Prom problems at Lavernia High School. A student who attended the event on Saturday now testing positive for COVID-19. The news leading to the high school's more than 800 students to be sent home early today. They will need to attend classes virtually through Tuesday, May 18th. In a letter to parents, the principal asked students to be monitored for any symptoms while at home. Those parents also encouraged to share this news of the potential exposure with any other students who attended prom but are not enrolled in high school, in that high school. Now let's take a look at the cases of coronavirus here in Bear County. 198 new cases confirmed today. There are also four more deaths documented to be related to COVID-19. In our hospitals, around 200 COVID-19 patients still remain hospitalized, 64 in intensive care, 35 are on ventilators. Well, there is no doubt that the state's child welfare system is in trouble. Many point to multiple challenges forcing providers to close down. Family Tapestry, the children's shelter's wing in charge of finding safe environments for children in Bear County, has chosen to terminate its contract with the state. The move comes 
comes after the state ordered every child out of its emergency shelter, citing unacceptable conditions. Community-based care was a way to transform foster care, but it's proving to be difficult. The night team's Jaffney Gray with one group's opinion on how to move forward. It doesn't have to derail community-based care, but we do have to learn from it to make sure that it doesn't happen again. Katie Oles, the CEO of the Texas Alliance of Child and Family Services, is weighing in on Family Tapestry's recent announcement that it is terminating its contract with the state for community-based care. Family Tapestry is a division of the Children's Shelter in charge of finding placement for children in Bear County. Oles says organizations like Family Tapestry are under a lot of pressure and the pandemic has only made it worse. It's impacted the workforce. It's impacted our ability to, to recruit foster parents and, and go into homes. She also says a lack of funding has presented challenges for certain organizations, which is something the CEO of the Children's Shelter also noted in a letter to the Texas Department of Family and Protective Services in April. That letter asking DFPS to account for the increased cost of supporting the needs of children in placement in light of the unanticipated and ongoing capacity crisis. Growing costs and, and to recruit and support and train and, and look at making sure we're building innovation and incorporating best practices. Some organizations that carry out community-based care have expressed concerns with the state's strict oversight, but Ol says it's for the safety of the children, which is top of mind for everyone. She says the state legislature is looking at ways to improve the child welfare system. They're going to provide guidance on the kind of quality and safety of care that we want to see in the state. Also directing some innovation and some pilots of some family preservation models and some prevention programs. In a letter sent to the chairs of the Senate and House Health and Human Services Committees, DFPS says it is in communication with providers and concerns over heightened monitoring, capacity and support and looking at ways to improve the system. Ol says now the family tapestry is out of the picture. These children will still receive services and support from other agencies. The state now taking over the community based care for the area. Jaffney Gray, KSAT 12 News. Thank you, Jaffney. New tonight, a fugitive trying to hide with family now found. Investigators tracking him down in Live Oak early this morning. 33 year old Salvador Rubio wanted for a murder case in Dallas. Live Oak police first receive information. He may be in our area yesterday evening. Investigators say they later learned family members were trying to shield him from being discovered. It didn't work. With help from area agencies, Live Oak police were able to find Rubio near the corner of Sandpiper and Leading Oak around 2.30 this morning. Tiny homes meant to help a big issue. Phase one is underway for a community meant to help seniors who are homeless. The Housing First Community Coalition is converting a piece of land located on the east side of Dietrich Road and breaking ground on Town Twin Village. Plans show space for tiny homes, RVs and apartments. There would also be a chapel along with a laundry and community center. The hope is to cut down on the tent cities we've seen pop up around town. This type of affordable housing would be for those who are 50 years and older and who have been homeless for a year. These are affordable units, so the rent is only going to be 30% of your income. And so there will be some people that don't have any income at all, and we have gotten a grant to help subsidize their rent. Enough money was raised to begin phase one, which includes some of the tiny homes and RVs. That is expected to be completed by the fall. Money is still being raised for phase two, but if all goes well, this community would be able to offer 205 housing options by 2024. Still ahead on the Night Beat, voter ID is a hot topic during the elections. One viral post on social media making a claim about voter IDs and Mexico. We'll show you where that claim falls on the trust index. And after a year away, the spirit of Fiesta in the air. We're going to show you the newly released collectible Fiesta poster and hear from the artist who is now part of history. Plus, a massive case of mail theft leading investigators to a woman already known to authorities in San Antonio. It's coming up next on The Night Beat. A massive case of mail theft leading investigators to one woman in San Antonio. Police say 39-year-old Stacy Ebram found in a stolen car at a gas station. Inside that vehicle, officers say they discovered 72 pieces of stolen mail, all coming from a Northside apartment complex near 1604 and Blanco. 
Investigators say surveillance video showed Ibram pry those mailboxes open. According to an arrest affidavit, police described Ibram, Ibram as a known mail theft and identity and known in other mail theft and identity theft cases. The latest case she's accused in means she faces a third degree felony for mail theft. The debate over voter ID laws in several states, including Texas, has sparked a lot of conversation online. And one of those conversations caught our eye. This meme, which has been widely shared on Facebook, suggests that voters in Mexico must have a photo ID to vote and must enroll and show proof of citizenship in order to get this card. So is this claim true? We ran it through our trust index to find out. It's a meme that has been posted by several users online and claims that voters in Mexico must apply and receive an ID before being able to vote. We asked UTSA Associate Professor of Political Science, Milena Ang, to tell us more about photo IDs in Mexico. Right now, it is one of the main, if not the main, um, way of identification, medium of identification for Mexicans. So driver's licenses, for example, they're not as widely accepted as this voter ID. Professor Eng says Mexico implemented voter IDs after the controversial 1988 presidential election in which the results were rigged. To help the public trust the voting process, the Federal Electoral Institute was created and a national voter ID was born. But there are clear differences in the Mexican voter ID versus some of the IDs being required in states across the U.S one of which is the ease by which to obtain them in Mexico. Another is that they are completely free. In Mexico, it's really easy to get one of these uh, voting credentials. There are some requirements that are necessary. Um, the requirements are a, a birth certificate, a proof of address, and some official identification. But once you have those three, you go to an office. There's thousands of offices throughout the, throughout the Mexican territory. So it's actually a very easy uh, you know, like it's a very easy credential to, to have access to it. So this claim on social media is true. The country does have national voter IDs, though their creation and implementation was under different circumstances than what some states are proposing today. Now, if you have a question or claim you'd like us to take a look at, you can submit it by going to ksat.com slash trust index. It's time for the big reveal. The official Fiesta poster for 2021 unveiled tonight at the Mays Family Center at the Witte Museum. You can see the symbol of the Alamo clearly defined, then repeated in a colorful pattern with the words Fiesta San Antonio. Artist Andy Benavides said he came up with this design after reflecting on the hardships the pandemic brought to many people this past year. So I came up with this spectrum of color that uh, I hoped when people saw it, they would smile and feel good. Benavidez also expressed gratitude and excitement in becoming part of Fiesta history when people reflect on the pandemic here in San Antonio and the Fiesta celebration. This year's Party with a Purpose begins officially on June 17th. We have the full schedule of events on KSAT.com. That is a beautiful piece really of art. Is. Let's take a live look outside with live cam this evening over the quarry, all lit up tonight, and a beautiful day, beautiful night out there with these temperatures. Yeah, we're not used to this. Mm -hmm. I know, right? <laughs> no umbrella today. I was just thinking that it's, wait, where are the storms? Where are they now? Where are they going to go? Nothing to worry about out there this evening. Actually, we have a couple of quiet days before our weather pattern gets active again. So tomorrow, Friday, no chance of rain. It's going to be more of the same, similar to what we had today with a lack of humidity. And then we get into the weekend right off the bat on Saturday. We boost those rain chances up to 60% and then still scattered activity periodically Sunday all the way into the middle part of next week. So. Get the yard work done now while you have a really good window of opportunity here the next couple of days. All right, let's talk about the aquifer. I want to let you know that it's up nearly 18 feet over the past 20 days. That is impressive. And you can see the big jump. This is the aquifer since March. You see the big dip there in April. Pumping season and a lack of rainfall. End of April, the rains 
kicked in, the sky opened up, and boom, we're up to 665.6. Still stage two watering restrictions, according to Saws. We'll let you know if that changes. We are looking at more rain in the forecast, so that's good. You don't need to be watering anytime soon. Quite across Texas, some active weather, basically along the east coast, mid-Atlantic area, southeast. Not a whole lot of activity across the nation right now. Our next weather maker is just a little ripple in the flow moving into the Pacific Northwest, and that's going to be affecting us in the days ahead, helping to boost those rain chances. Beautiful sky this evening, nice layers of clouds. 61 this morning, 4 degrees below average. 76 this afternoon, that's 10 degrees below average. Remember, we actually had the cold front move through yesterday, and that pushed in the cooler air and drier, less humid air. So we're 64 degrees right now with a dew point of only 54, and you felt the north wind throughout the day today. It was a little gusty out there. It's pumped the brakes quite a bit, and it's not as breezy right now. You look at the dew points, mostly in the 50s, some locations are around 60, but it's comfortable outside. It's pleasant, pleasant, especially relative to May standards, where these days usually don't last very long, and we only have two more of these days until the humidity spikes again on Saturday and then really jumps as we get into next week. It gets back into the oppressive levels where it's just sticky and sweaty out there. So, but that also adds to the rain chances as well. All right, let's talk about temperatures and what you can expect the next few days. Right now already upper 50s in the hill country. Kerrville, Fredericksburg, comfortable, 59. 60s elsewhere, even 71, Catula and Beeville. Tomorrow morning, I think we'll see it Many readings in the 50s, mid low to mid 50s in the hill country around San Antonio, about 59 degrees by the afternoon. Beautiful. Look at this into the 70s for highs right near 80 degrees near 80 down south. I think 70s around Bear County, Timberwood Park, Leon Springs, Holotus, about 73. Seguin 75 along with Elmendorf and Bernie about 71. That's with a light north wind at about 5 to 15 miles per hour. A mixture of sun and clouds throughout the day tomorrow. Again, no chance of rain here the next couple of days. We have this dry air and stable atmosphere in place. Stability goes by the wayside as we get into the weekend. Saturday, we're expecting more rain than just thunderstorms. Okay, so mainly just rain. We don't see a big hail threat or any wind threat on Saturday. Sunday is when the atmosphere starts to become more stable or unstable, I should say, and more conducive to actual thunderstorms. And then especially as we get into next week. So we will have to be watching some of those days closely. All right. Thank you, Adam. All right, if you're a Spurs fan, does it matter if they win their way into the play-in games or if they just happen to, I don't know, back their way back in? Back their way in, <laughs> yeah. does it matter? Well, tonight, if it's going to happen, it's going to be backing into yeah. the, not the playoffs, the play-in tournament, right. all right? That doesn't guarantee you a postseason appearance. When we come back, are the Spurs in? We get to check two scoreboards tonight to find out, and the Cowboys to kick off the 2021 NFL season, and you'll never guess against who. Coming up. Tip off the final road trip of the regular season tonight in Brooklyn. DeMar DeRozan going to work down low, draws the foul off the pump fake, and just throws up the ball towards the hoop, and the circus shot goes in somehow. But the Spurs go cold while the Nets get hot. Mike James runner in the lane, caps off a 13 and nothing run. Brooklyn up by 15. Spurs with zero assists, zero three pointers in the first quarter. Much better. Second quarter for San Antonio. Jakob Pertl swats the Mike James dunk attempt. Spurs going the other way. Lonnie Walker, the fourth, finds Rudy Gay in the corner for the three. Lead is down to six. DeMar to Walker for a three. And the Spurs are only down one. Spurs have six threes, nine assists in the second. Help the Spurs get back in this game down six at the break. Kevin Durant lighting the fire in the nets as he attacks the rim for the dunk. Then DeMar's pass gets picked off by Mike James. He goes in for the slam, and the Nets lead grows to 16. DeRozan doing his best to keep the Spurs close with the bank, plus the foul, but the Spurs would trail by 15 after three. Patty Mills knocks down a pair of three-pointers to get the Spurs within 13, but it wasn't enough. James Harden in his first game back in more than a month since injuring his hand hamstring, knocking down the step back three. He had 18 points in his return. Spurs fall 128 to 116. Now have to win to avoid their second consecutive losing season. That's win out. It's a good feeling knowing that it's not over for us and, you know, we can go make something happen and get in the playoffs, uh, you know, so at the end of the day, we just got to stick together, man. I just try to stay together with everybody from the young guys to the veterans we have, you know, try to keep everybody together. 
All right, next up, the Knicks tomorrow night in New York. Now, with the Spurs lost, San Antonio fans ironically had to become Maverick fans as Dallas is hosting New Orleans tonight. Pelicans putting up a fight early. Kira Lewis dishing to Jackson Hayes to throw down the reverse dunk. Then Hayes throwing back the putback jam to keep New Orleans within nine. But the Mavericks start to pull away. Luka Doncic to Willie Collins Stein on the alley oop. Dallas up 19 at halftime. Let's see if that has gone final, and it has. And the Spurs are in the play in tournament thanks to the Dallas Mavericks tonight, 125 to 107. Pro football coverage, powered by Davis Law Firm. The Dallas Cowboys have kicked out the NFL's 2021 season on Thursday, September the 9th, against the defending Super Bowl champion Tampa Bay Buccaneers. The NFL could not pass on this marquee matchup that has so much drama to play out in the first game of the regular season. First, it'll be Mark the return of Dak Prescott, who suffered a season-ending injury to his right ankle in just the fifth game of the regular season against the Giants. That's after he was setting all kinds of Cowboys passing records before his season came to an abrupt end in the Cowboys season ending with a 6-10 finish. Now, after using the draft to bolster the Dallas D. Now they get a big first test against seven-time Super Bowl champion Tom Brady and the Tampa Bay Buccaneers, who brought all of their 22 starters back for the coming season. Besides the season opener, the rest of the Cowboys' schedule was released tonight, including their annual Thanksgiving Day game. Let's run down some key dates here. Their first game against Philadelphia will be on Monday Night Football, September the 27th. They're playing at Kansas City on November the 21st. Thanksgiving Day against the Las Vegas Raiders. Wrap up the season on January the 9th against Philadelphia. The Houston Texans will help kick off their first full weekend of the NFL football season on Sunday, September the 12th, when they host the Jacksonville Jaguars at NRG Stadium at noon. This is another matchup that features some interesting storylines. First of all, it's the NFL debut of both head coaches, Urban Meyer as the head coach of the Jaguars, David Culley, the new head coach of the Houston Texans. It's also the debut of number one draft pick Trevor Lawrence as a quarterback of the Jaguars. And for Houston, who knows, given the fact that Sean Watson is facing 22 lawsuits that alleged sexual assault and inappropriate conduct, there's been a big question mark as to who will be the starting quarterback on opening day with the possibility of former Stanford quarterback Davis Mills the Texans first draft pick as a possibility. key dates including the opening day that will be in Houston by the way then on uh, October the 24th at Arizona they wrap up their season January the 9th against Tennessee at noon a celebration of life for Jake Ellinger next celebration of life held in Austin this afternoon following the death, death of Jake Ellinger, the Texas Longhorn linebacker and brother to former Longhorn quarterback Sam Ellinger. Around 800 people attended the services of the Riverbend Church for the former Westlake and University of Texas football player who was found dead last week. There is still no cause of death that has been released. His brother Sam and Chaparral's head coach Todd Dodge were among today's speakers. Sign of the Times, Johnson High School held their annual football banquets uh, awards banquet outside tonight at Hero Stadium so that the players, coaches, staff, along with family and friends could be safely distanced during the COVID pandemic. Well, it's a special group, so we definitely wanted to um, have a, a celebration that was up and worthy to what these kids did. I mean, they, they stuck together through thick and thin, had a common cause to get to the playoffs and go as many rounds as we could. And uh, we just got to celebrate this special bunch of seniors. You know, normally they're held at the school itself in one of the larger venues there. That's not the case this year, but I'm glad they were able to make those arrangements. And the Spurs, right, again, they're in the play-in tournament now at at least number 10, does not guarantee you a playoff appearance. Yeah, and in coming days you can explain this whole play-in and what they have to we'll, do. We'll get to that. Officially we'll in the playoffs <laughs> and, and who's going to play who. Right, yeah. we'll get we to that. We might need to take a 30-minute show just for <laughs> that great. <laughs> but be, you can you can we'll do that. It. All right, thank you. <laughs> okay, we'll be right back.